A car breaks down on a late February afternoon. Two men start searching for a piece of pipe to try and fix their vehicle. They entered an abandoned apartment building at 5635 Clemens Avenue, and after searching the main floor, the men crept downstairs into the basement. Blinded by the darkness, one of the men flicked a cigarette lighter. The horror revealed by the flames sent them running for the police, their minds tainted by the ghastly sight of a decapitated body. Face down amid the boiler room rubble lay the headless body of an African-American female. Naked from the waist down, she wore only a yellow v-neck sweater fitted loosely around her torso, fingers flecked with chipped crimson red nail polish. Her hands were bound behind her back with a strand of red and white nylon rope. Between her shoulders, where her neck used to be, there was only a hack-sawed hole. It is a case that has horrified St. Louisans and stump police detectives for decades. An unidentified victim, no murder weapon, no suspect, and unfortunately, no arrest. This is the case of the St. Louis Jane Doe. It's February 28, 1983, when St. Louis homicide detectives Joe Burgoon and Herb Riley arrived. The building was teeming with police. Awaiting crime scene technicians, the two veteran detectives speculated on the corpse's identity. Maybe, they guessed, she was a prostitute or drug addict from nearby Capon Courts, a housing prospect with a murderous past. It wasn't until technicians at last rolled the body over that they realized she was not a woman, but a prepubescent child. Instantly, the mood in that damp cellar turned from morbid curiosity to disgust. A child killer. At the time, the FBI called it the only decapitation in the nation involving someone so young. As police officers searched a 16-block area for the girl's head, Burgoon and Riley returned to headquarters to check missing persons reports. Surely, they thought, the girl's parents or relatives, someone, would call to report her missing. And with any luck, they'd establish her identity that night and draw up a list of suspects. However, the body went unclaimed on a slab in the city morgue for more than a week before it was given the name Jane Doe. For nine months, she lay frozen. Finally, on a glum, rainy day in December 1983, she was buried in a pauper's grave in a historic black graveyard in North St. Louis County. At the funeral were a few homicide detectives, the chief medical examiner, and a half dozen news reporters. Four muddy grave diggers served as pallbearers. As he was leaving, Herb Riley told a reporter, I've been involved with her since the day she was found, and I'll be damned if I'm going to stop looking for her killer. The day of the grisly discovery, February 28th, still cast a pall over the homicide department. For years, Detective Burgoon commemorated that day by sending out teletype bulletins to police departments in all 50 states. No one ever responded. After a dozen years, he was told the mass dispatches were too costly to continue. Never a suspect, never an arrest, and never was a head found. Most of what is known of Jane Doe came within days of her discovery. She was likely between the ages of 8 and 11. She was big for her age, around 4 foot 10. Without the head, she measured just over 4 feet. She had been raped and then strangled. Based on the lack of blood at the crime scene, police believe she was dumped in the basement after her beheading. Mold growing from the wound on her neck indicated she was there for several days before the two men found her. Little else is known about the girl who became the most notorious cold case in the nearly 200-year history of the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department. Thousands of futile police hours have been spent. The cops who first worked the investigation have retired or died of old age. A new generation of homicide detectives are still at work on the case, hoping that DNA technology will spark even the slightest clue. They say they're nowhere near given up, but the odds are stacked against them. In his mind, Joe Burgoon could still see the building where they found the girl. It's three stories high, brick, with the Latin word for home, dolmi, inscribed in stone above the doorway. Traces of blood streaked the cellar walls where the killer dragged the body into the darkness. There was no smell of death. The coolness of the basement had preserved the body. Hours after finding the girl's mutilated body, Burgoon and Riley sent out all points bulletins nationwide. When the dispatches yielded nothing, they began checking school attendance records, looking for students no longer on the rolls. 
Only the St. Louis Public Schools kept computerized attendance records at the time, but even those lists gave no indication as to where a student went after leaving the school. For the most part, it was guesswork, with detectives calling as many as a half dozen school districts before locating a child. For each child eliminated, hundreds more remained to be checked. So mind-numbingly frustrating was the task that Detective Wayne Bender was hospitalized for migraines. Finally, some seven months after the murder, the detectives accounted for every 8- to 11-year-old black female enrolled in St. Louis City Schools and the neighboring districts of University City, Wellston, Ferguson, Florescent, and Normandy. Who was she? Desperate for something, anything, police have tracked down a score of false leads over the years, some more preposterous than others. There was, for example, the time, just months after the murder, that a frantic woman appeared at police headquarters claiming to have just met the killer. He lived just a few blocks from the shuttered building. The woman said the man invited her into his apartment and showed her a human skull and a machete. Minutes later, Bagoon, Riley, and Atkins arrived at the apartment with a search warrant and a sledgehammer. They busted down the door and recovered the skull and knife. The machete? That was a novelty piece you could bend a million ways. It could never cut someone's head off, recalls Burgoon. He got the skull from his high school teacher in California. It was all verified. He wasn't our guy. Then there was the Charlotte police officer who got a skull from a man he had questioned at a storage shed on St. Charles Rock Road. According to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Danny Davis, a Pagedale, told the cop he bought the skull for $35 in the late 1970s at a souvenir gift shop near Northwest Plaza Shopping Center. Davis said he was told the skull was that of a young Indian woman who had been killed by a tomahawk. A forensic anthropologist determined it was too old to be Jane Doe's skull. Other leads have been less conventional. Grasping for clues, Burgoon once sat in on a seance in a Maplewood home. Under dim candlelight, the detective passed around photocopied fingerprints of Jane Doe to a table full of psychics. As the clairvoyance channeled the spirits, Burgoon sat in the corner and observed. The psychics put their hands on the fingerprints and would shoot straight up in the chairs like they got a jolt or something, remembers Burgoon. At the end of the meeting, they told me to call the Coast Guard. The head is on a boat in the Gulf of Mexico. The seance wouldn't be the last time homicide detectives looked to the paranormal for help. In 1994, Burgoon and Atkins agreed to appear on Sightings, a nationally syndicated television show on the occult and the supernatural. Connected by phone, the homicide detectives sat in St. Louis with notepads at the ready while a psychic in Florida entered the mind of Jane Doe. Producers filled in the backdrop with Hitchcockian theme music and shadowy, slow-motion footage of children at play. The final product was vague enough to seem eerily real, but it only harmed the investigation. Prior to the show's taping, detectives mailed the psychic the bloody sweater and the nylon rope used to bind Jane Doe's hands. They never got them back. The evidence was lost in the mail. Perhaps the most far-fetched story surrounding the case came in 2002 when Sharon Nolte called detectives. A Kansas City insurance investigator, she was convinced that Jane Doe was a Chippewa Indian named Shannon Johnson. Nolte said she also knew the killer, a drifter, living in southern Texas. She worked the case independently for seven years before contacting the police, her investigation taking her to an Indian reservation in Minnesota, where she collected sample DNA from a woman that she believed to be related to Jane Doe. She says she even visited the killer, inviting herself into his home and collecting DNA evidence in his bathroom. Nolte has had very few positive things to say about the St. Louis Police Department. She claims that her story fell on deaf ears, that Carol and Burgoon never took her seriously. Of the 23000 that she says she spent on the case, $4,500 went to a private lab that tested the DNA against that of Jane Doe. The test came back negative, but Nolte still maintains she was right. I don't give a rat's ass about the police department. I think they stink, she says. I told them who she was and who killed her, and they never did anything with it. I had a bag full of the killer's pubic hair. Do you know how difficult it is to collect a bag full of pubic hair? As with all the people who have stepped forward to help police solve the case, Carolyn Burgoon said they appreciate Nolte's efforts, but in the end, her story just didn't add up. You don't want to play anyone cheap, said Burgoon. 
In a case as tough as this one, you want to listen to what anyone has to say. In 2009, police wanted to exhume little Jane Doe's body to run new tests in an attempt to identify her. Unfortunately, her remains weren't in their listed location. Instead, authorities found three other bodies near her gravestone. Washington Park Cemetery had been neglected for decades. Researchers from Washington University in St. Louis ultimately helped locate little Jane Doe's remains by examining old photographs and utilizing geolocation. She was finally exhumed in June of 2013. Her remains were examined by researchers from the Smithsonian Institution and the University of North Texas. They took DNA and bone samples for isotope testing, with the hope being they could identify where she lived by the mineral content in her bones. They determined the girl lived in any of the 10 southeastern states. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children lists the following seven states on Little Jane Doe's profile. Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, or Wisconsin. Little Jane Doe was reburied following an hour-long ceremony on February 8, 2014 at the Garden of Innocence in Calvary Cemetery. This time, dozens of people turned out for the service. A grave marker identifies her as Hope. The building where Hope was discovered was torn down. It's been replaced by a senior living apartment complex. The St. Louis City Cold Case Unit, formed in 2019, has a room devoted just to the case of little Jane Doe. Of all of the children listed on the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, little Jane Doe is the only child without a photo or facial reconstruction image attached to their profile. Police are still looking for tips on this homicide and several other unsolved cases. You can send them by email to homicidecoldcase at slmpd.org or you can call the Homicide Division directly at 314-444-5371. Anyone with a tip who wants to remain anonymous and is interested in a reward can contact Crime Stoppers at 866-371-TIPS or visit their website, Crime Stoppers.